Happy Friday, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nick Demetto, the state member for Hinchinbrook and also deputy leader of the KAP. This morning, you're with us on Catter's Australian Party Recap. We let you know exactly what Catter's Australian Party MPs have been up to, not only in Parliament at state and federal level, but also back in their electorates of Traeger, Hinchinbrook and Hill, and of course, Bob Catter and Kennedy. So Bob actually made his statement this week on the voice to parliament for Indigenous Australians. Now, isn't it funny, every time the Labor government gets into power at the federal level, what they seem to do is want to make, muck around and mess with the Australian constitution. Now, this voice to parliament will mean that there will be a constitutional change to the, uh, the guiding documents of this country and giving to give first Australians a voice in parliament. Now, Bob made his position clear. He said last week, that he would like to see First Australians given a few more rights in this country. And he said, firstly, he wants to see First Australians given the ability to actually own their own homes. Yes, in some of these remote Indigenous communities, First Australians can't even own their own homes. This is like places like Mornington Island, Doomadgee. Uh, they still have to lease or, um, or rent the properties off the state or federal government, which is an absolute atrocity in this country. He also said he wants to get rid of alcohol management plans. Now, um, we've seen some of these alcohol management plans put in place over the years with perhaps some of the best intentions, but they've had some in unintended adverse effects to how uh, communities have run. And we've seen you know, community members turn into criminals just trying to enjoy a drink. But also we've seen the problems spill over in the other parts of the, of the nation, but also from state to state where, for example, alcohol bans in the Northern Territory are heavily affecting things in Mount Isa in the Traeger electorate for people like Robbie Catter and those police officers trying to manage things there. Uh, so Bob wants to see us get rid of that. Also he'd like to address the poor health and nutrition and the short life expectancy for Aboriginal peoples in some of the remote Indigenous communities. So to address that problem he wants to see a reintroduction of market gardens in those remote Indigenous communities so to ensure that the people living in these areas have access to fresh fruit and vegetables. And, and that's important. Robbie Catter this week spent some time in Charters Towers and they've had the grand opening in Charters Towers of the Gold Towers. Now this is an amazing new shopping complex. Uh, it's a great investment for Charters Towers and it's good to see fresh steel in Rio coming out of the ground and seeing new buildings in, become fruition. And now one thing that they did do on Friday, now this is pretty cool, uh, at the front of the new shopping centre, there's got a huge steel globe. It's called The World. And it's actually got a QR code on there. And you can actually see, uh, you type in your address, uh, sorry, your postcode and your name. And, uh, and it tells you exactly how far you are from exactly uh, your place of residency in the world. So pretty cool. And it's a nice little gimmick, but it actually uh, really puts Charters Towers on the map. And maybe one of those Instagram worthy photos coming right up. While Robbie Catter is in Parliament this week, uh, there was a number of pieces of legislation before the House, but what really interested myself, Robbie and Shane Canoe from the KAP was the amendments that the Labor government were putting through for the Animal Care and Protection Act. Now, there was a report done earlier uh, last year that was tabled uh, that triggered this uh, amendment act. We, wouldn't, we wanted to see the RSPCA actually um, some of their power has been taken away through this amendment. So during the, um, the, the consideration and detail, the KAP did our best to introduce amendments to the bill that would have seen the removal of the enforcement and prosecutional powers of RSPCA. Now, the reason behind this is the RSPCA has legislative powers right now that allow them to basically act as a third party police force which is pretty scary because if you go and have a look at their website, they're trying to shut down all sorts of things like rodeos, hunting with pig dogs, hunting in general. And these organisations are, you know, we're very concerned about the amount of power that the state government is just handing over to them through prosecution and investigational powers. Also during the amendments, we tried to introduce uh, a delay in the ban of yellow phosphorus or SAP. Now this is an important pig... Uh, feral pig poison that are being used out there to control feral pigs. And while we've got diseases like lumpy skin uh, on our doorstep in Indonesia and foot and mouth disease, we should be using every tool possible in the event of an outbreak. Also, providing exemptions for professional dog trainers to use uh, these 
Now, th these prong collars, they look very scary. And we might even be able to get a picture of that up for us to have a quick look at. These prong collars, uh, are very, they, like, I said, like I said, look a little scary, but the reality is they're like a, a bed of nails because the pressure is uh, actually applied up to, over such a large surface area. Uh, when you even put one of them around your arm, leg, or I've seen some people put them around their own neck, I definitely wouldn't. Um, <laughs> look a little bit kinky if you ask me. Uh, but uh, they don't hurt at all, and they're used as more of a sensory thing for controlling dogs that are, otherwise may actually have to be put down. Robbie Catter this week has also responded very strongly to what will be a $4.5 billion windfall for the state government and the price hike on, right, on royalties for coal miners out there. Now, we're not overly concerned about coal miners paying a little bit uh, more royalties, but if the state government's hell-bent on collecting this, we want to see this funding actually return back to the regions that's generating this income. And we don't want to build sports stadiums and things for the Olympics for the state government to go and have a big party with in 2032. We're talking about roads, rail infrastructure, marine and port access. Those are the things that the state government need to be spending this money on now. When we know, they've talked about regions in the past, um, that's more likely to be things to fund uh, their $20 billion commitment to the Olympic Games. We want to see the money spent on things like the Bruce Highway, uh, the Coranda Range Bypass in Cairns, and a two to $300 million package for, uh, for rural road sealing. Shane Knuth this week has been pretty happy to get back into the electorate, and I think he rushed back on Friday, especially because he had the, uh, the Innisfail Rotary Street party, and it was a cracker night with the street night raffle on, and they raised a heap of money for local charities. We also seen Shane get up to the Tolga Markets, which reportedly had the best produce uh, all year from the Tablelands, and everyone that was up there was all, all, all very happy to catch up with Shane Canoof. While Shane Canoof was also in the electorate this week of Hill, he sh shot up to Dembula to catch up with locals at the cr Christmas Under the Stars Sensail. Now, this is also a great turnout and also a great opportunity for people to have a chat with Shane and talk to him about what he's been doing in Parliament uh, in the last sitting week. While we're talking about what Shane Knuth was up to in state parliament last week, Shane Knuth has a bee in his bonnet about the wind farms that are proposed in the Hill electorate. Now, and rightly so, the Chalumban residents and the people that live around the area where they're via tagged uh, for these wind farms uh, are not very happy at all, and they don't want them to go ahead. And the interesting thing is these wind farms have uh, a provision in the tree clearing legislation in Queensland that allows them to go ahead and circumnavigate some of those, uh, those requirements that, say, a grazier or a farmer would have. That's why Shane Knuth used his question without notice to the Deputy Premier this week to ask, will the Deputy Premier move legislation to make amendments to the, look, to the Vegetation Management Act to ensure that these World Heritage listed areas are protected from these wind farm developments? Mr Speaker, State Planning Code 23 for wind farms overrides the Vegetation Management Act, which means that proposed wind farms such as Shalumban are given a free pass to be built in communities that are deemed to have vulnerable, threatened or endangered habitats. Will the Minister commit to fast-tracking amendments to the State Planning Code 23 to ensure critical habitats is not being cleared for wind farms? After a long, extended sitting week in Parliament last week, it was great for me to get back on the last flight to Townsville uh, to get back and do a couple of things back in the Hinchinbrook electorate. Uh, on Sunday, we had the charity ride for the Salvation Army where we had the toy charity ride where I got a chance to get out on my uh, little motorbike there and go and deliver some toys uh, during the ride. It was great to see so many people come out. And uh, it was the 42nd toy run. And I've been told this is the longest running Christmas toy run in Australia. A great achievement for those Townsville organisers, but also a great uh, ch chance to support the Salvation Army. During the week, I've been able to shoot up to Ingham on Monday, and I got up there to the PCYC Emergency Services Cadet Graduation. This is a great initiative uh, that's been sponsored by PCYC to make sure that we've got opportunities for our young people locally in the Hinchbrook electorate to get involved, get involved, I should say, with the emergency services. So they get to do things like interface with uh, QFAS, police, foreign emergency services. Uh, we also get a chance to um, do some stuff with SES, as well as volunteer around town. Uh, these kids will be our future leaders when it comes to 
uh, volunteering in emergency services, but also uh, maybe our future police officers, ambulance officers and fire, firemen and women. Last night, it was an absolute honour to be invited along to the North Shore State School to not only attend the graduation, grade six graduation night, but also got a chance to hand out the sports award for excellence. Uh, it was great to catch up with the school leaders there and wish them luck as they go on and transition into grade seven next year. As they scoot off to high school, I want to wish every one of those students and all the students across the Hinchinbrook electorate all the best for 2023. It was an extremely busy week in Parliament last week and uh, one of the things that we were able to organise was a meeting between myself, the Deputy Premier and Mayor Raymond Jayo uh, and James Stewart from the Hinchinbrook Shire Council to get down there and really explain why we need a seawall uh, at Dungeness for Enterprise Channel. Uh, we've got approvals to do some dredging, to put the sand back on the sand spit, but we need a rock wall to retain that sand and keep the mouth of that creek open so that we can retain uh, access at all tides for that area. And it was um, great to see the Deputy Premier during a question without notice commit to supporting the Hinchbrook Shire Council to the tune of three to $400,000 to make sure the last of those sand studies uh, are able to be completed so that the modelling can be done so that hopefully we can get the approvals in the new year. As people might know, I've got an ethanol bill. It's our fuel, uh, liquid fuel supply bill before Parliament at the moment. And it's about making sure that those that purchase E10 at the Bowser are guaranteed to have between 9 and 10% ethanol in that fuel blend. Currently, uh, that ethanol blend could be as low as 1%. I got a chance to address the Transport Committee and they asked some really great questions. Uh, it was good to give some answers on some of those questions around ethanol and talk about the viability of the ethanol industry in Queensland. What, what like do you think we would get out of this whole process once, if this was in place? So um, looking at some of the bigger vehicle manufacturers across the world, um, you'd be um, remiss to not notice Toyota and the way Toyota has um, pivoted with the market. They haven't gone to a full electric vehicle yet. Um, because they see a, a quite a lengthy, um, I guess, market window for hybrid vehicles. Now, uh, most people would understand hybrid vehicles. They have uh, an engine that does run the, the, the wheels and stuff, but electric motors can take over, and that motor can therefore charge the, the batteries to run those electric motors. Um, the fact is we are still using a fuel, uh, liquid fuel to burn in that engine. Why wouldn't we use the most environmentally friendly uh, fuel that's possible, which is uh, an ethanol bio-based blend? Um, E10 uh, has actually been proven to have up to 28% less tailpipe emissions than, um, than regular dirty RON91 unleaded fuel. So if we're able to make sure that those people that have decided to buy um, a hybrid vehicle and then fuel it with the cleanest fuel, E10, that they are actually guaranteed that there's going to be an amount of ethanol in there so they're getting the most environmental bang for bucks out of the car. Also this week in Parliament, uh, we were sprung, you know, the, the state government pulls all sorts of funny tricks in Parliament and they sprung with not even five minutes notice, a motion without notice on supporting the voice to Parliament. Now, Robbie Catter and I had an, a little bit to say on that and watch the video below. It's, um, it was interesting because, you know, we might be for this, we might be against this, but the reality is uh, we have not been briefed on not only what uh, pathway to treaty might mean for us Queenslanders, but also what the voice to parliament might mean for all us Queenslanders. And I think we should be educated a lot more on this, or at least briefed, before asking us such a, a, a burning question and an important question, you know, without even three minutes chance to, uh, to, to get ready. I could agree with this. I, I'm not saying I disagree with it, but... <laughs> What I get really annoyed about is that this becomes the focus and, and oh no, everything will be solved by the truth. No, hang on, we need to work with things on the ground now because I've been coming in here now for 10 years trying to get action on uh, things like blue cards, title deeds, um, and, and uh, alcohol management plan at Mornington Island took about eight, nine years to get. So they're the things that are, tr are, are tricky, they're hard, but this is, this is the part, this becomes the priority. I do have the document in front of me here. The Uluru Statement from the heart. There are a lot of words in here, but there is not a lot of detail, Mr Speaker, on what this will mean. And I think it must be very hard for those elected members of Parliament that are from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent 
to be told that their voice in this parliament, in federal parliament, hasn't broken through the party structure. We've got a Labor government here in Queensland that says the only way to fix and get a proper voice in the government and proper consultation with First Nations people is to have a constitutional voice enshrined in parliament. I think that is a shame. Shame that the problems with health, the problems with education, the problems with crime, the problems with employment in this state have not broken through the party structure and changed things when it comes to regulation legislation when having these caucus meetings. If you're in the Hinchinbrook electorate, you might have received a Christmas card from myself this week. I hope you enjoyed seeing my little niece and nephew's drawing in there. Thea and Arch were just wrapped being asked to, uh, to put that together. And I, I think it's uh, Santa Claus and the reindeers and, of course, Rudolph with his big red nose at the top. Uh, pretty cute if you ask me. And thank you very much if you're, uh, you received that and you enjoyed it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, that's the Cat's Australian Party recap for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the, the light banter and the understanding a little bit further of what your Cat Australian Party MPs have been up to. Uh, it's been a pleasure meeting with you all again, and we'll talk again in a week. Enjoy your weekend. Cheers.